Hello and welcome. I'm Dr. Emma Cefaloni, and on behalf of CME Outfitters, I would like to welcome and thank you for joining us for today's educational activity titled Clinical Insights on Recent Advances in Spinal Muscular Atrophy. This activity is brought to you by CME Outfitters, an award-winning accredited provider of continuing education for clinicians around the globe. Our goal of today's activity is to enable our learners to accurately diagnose and treat patients with SMA. So please send us your questions and feedback. Again, I'm Dr. Emma Cefaloni. I'm the Robert C. and Rosalind H. Griggs Professor in Experimental Therapeutics of Neurologic Disease, Professor of Neurology, Pediatrics, and Obstetrics and Gynecology, and Director of Pediatric Neuromuscular Medicine at the University of Rochester, School of Medicine and Dentistry, Rochester, New York. Joining me today are my colleagues, Dr. John Branzima and Nancy Coons. John is a neurologist and neuromuscular section head at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, an assistant professor of clinical neurology at the Perlman School of Medicine, University of Pennsylvania. Great to have you with us, John. Pleasure to be here. Nancy is a child neurologist and medical director of the Matza Foundation Neuromuscular Disorders Program and Muscular Dystrophy Association Care Center at the Anne and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago. She's also professor of pediatrics and neurology at the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine, Chicago. Happy to have you with us, Nancy. Thank you. The learning objectives of these educational activities are review the pathophysiology and therapeutic targets of SMA, apply the current recommendation for screening and early diagnosis of SMA, and evaluate the latest clinical data on the efficacy and safety of approved and emerging therapies for SMA. Let's start with an overview of SMA. So SMA is the leading genetic cause of infant death with an estimated incidence of about one in 10,000 live births in the United States with some geographical <coughs> variation. And um, in 2016, there was approximately an estimation of about 9,000 individual total uh, for all types of SMA in the United States uh, living with the disease. And it's interesting because it's uh, the definition, the FDA definition of a rare disease is 200,000 or less. So we're really thinking about a ultra rare disease. And yet, um, something that for neurologists is, is, is very impor important <coughs> and not so uncommon. And the uh, heterozygous uh, carrier is about one in 50. So um, Nancy, mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit um, about the natural history of SMA, especially the type one, the most severe form. Well, SMA has been described by clinicians for over 100 years. And at the beginning, there was um, some controversy about whether the infants who presented with the lower motor neuron weakness and hypotonia and decreased reflexes had the same disorder as some of the um, older children or um, young adults who had a milder form of the disease with the same muscle weakness and um, low uh, muscle stretch reflexes. Um, but uh, in 1995, the gene was identified. It's uh, in, the, in this most common form of SMA, it's the survival motor neuron gene, SMN1. And um, this has allowed people to first clarify that there really is a clinical spectrum of SMA from infant onset to young adult, um, milder form of the disease, as well as to unify um, groups of children who have the same genetic disorder so that a natural history can be ident identified and uh, described. Um, a group of expert clinicians in the northeastern part of the United States has published um, a, a natural history of untreated SMA um, based on their patients. And uh, you can see it on the, uh, this slide. Um, this emphasizes the most frequent type of SMA, which is the infantile onset, by definition with onset clinically before six months of age, but not in the newborn period, more between two and six months of age. And what this contrasts is the um, typical motor milestones, which are in the um, green blocks, um, that are achieved by children over the first two years of life. And superimposed on that is a graph showing the survival curve and showing the progression of the disorder, not just in terms of loss of motor skills, 
continuously from the time the first clinical symptoms are described, but also the loss of the children, um, who without artificial support of ventilation and nutrition typically don't survive beyond two years so of age. So this is very homogeneous for type 1. The progression of the disease is quite homogeneous and basically by 20 months or so the survival is virtually less than 10 percent. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about um, there is type 1 to type 3. What does that mean? And, um, well historically that... before they had the gene to um, uh, clarify the um, presence of the spinal muscular atrophy of this sort, clinicians divided the children into um, different categories hoping to establish a prognosis for the families. Um, they considered type 1 infants who had onset between 2 and 6 months of age and who uh, never achieved the ability to sit independently. Again, we've mentioned that uh, the vast majority of these children did not survive beyond age 2. There was a milder form, it was kind of an intermediate form, where the children had slower onset, so they were able to sit independently with the onset more usually between 6 and 18 months of age, but they did not progress to be able to bear weight on their lower extremities, walk or climb. Um, the type 3 is uh, quite variable, but it occurred in children after they began walking independently, anywhere from toddler years up to young adult years. Um, and they would not uh, begin running or climbing or they would lose their um, abilities in that regard and, and start falling frequently. So Those children frequently had normal lifespans but did not um, ambulate throughout their entire life. Right, and so usually for the type 3 is the onset of symptoms is always after 18 months, but it can vary sometimes mm -hmm. even past uh, 3 years of age. And then the mm -hmm. type 4 is quite rare and it's really an adult form with Correct. onset of symptoms 18 years right. or older. But they're, all types are progressive, it's just the rate of progression differs. Um, so John, let's go over the genetics of SMA. When we use the term spinal muscular atrophy, there's a broad range of genetic causes of that. But the most common is the 5Q form of SMA. We call it 5Q because it's on chromosome 5 involving the Q arm. Um, on this chromosome, there are two genes. The SMN1 gene is telomeric and the SMN2 gene is centromeric that are homologs. And in the vast majority of people with the classical form of SMA, um, they'll be missing their SMN1 gene because most or part of it is deleted, leading to to it be, being non-functional. Um, in the other three or so percent of patients with the classical form of SMA, um, they will not be having a deleted copy of SMN1, but rather a sequence change or some sort of genetic inversion, um, something that's leading the SMN1 gene to be non-functional. Um, but this SMN1 gene is very important for the production of survival motor neuron or SMN protein. Um, as we look into the genetic underpinnings of this, we can see that SMN1 gene makes SMN protein very effectively. Um, the SMN2 <coughs> gene is quite similar to SMN1. There's only about six or seven nucleotides different between the two in most individuals. Uh, but one of the uh, differences is key. It's a C to T transition around exon 7. Uh, and this transition leads to splicing that does not include exon 7 in the transcript most of the time. 90% of the time it's not included, leading to a truncated protein protein being expressed, and the body sees this as non-functional and degrades it. Only about 10% of the time through alternative splicing does SMN2 mm. successfully make uh, full-length SMN protein. A functional protein. Mm. That leads us, uh, Nancy, maybe you can tell us a little bit about this, uh, the correlation between the SMN2 copy number and the phenotype, the clinical severity of disease. As John has indicated, the SMN2 copy number um, correlates with the amount of SMN protein that the individual lacking SMN1 makes. And uh, clinicians over time have noticed um, that there is a, um, a correlation between the uh, clinical presentation with the type 1 or infantile onset having fewer copies in general of the SMN2 and then the less severe uh, cases of SMA having more copies because they have more SMN protein. The important thing to recognize is that this is our best biomarker currently available, but there is not a complete linear correlation. Right. As you can see from this bar graph, um, the majority of individuals with infantile onset have two copies of SMN2, but there are individuals who have one or three. 
Same thing with type 2 or the intermediate uh, form. Most of them have three copies of SMN2, but there is some variation. It's even more variable with the milder onset of type 3. Yeah, which is important to remember because this is something that we use practically in clinical practice to kind of um, uh, discuss the prognosis, but it's not 100%. So right. in pre-symptomatic uh, uh, babies, this is the best biomarker we have, but it's by no means 100% um, right. uh, exactly. pre precise. Exactly. Um, so the incidence and the prevalence of SMA, uh, the different types, is kind of important to uh, spend a moment on this, because while the incidence, about 85% of cases are really type 1 and type 2, because type 1 morbidity and mortality is so high, um, when you uh, look at prevalent cases, so established cases in our clinic, clinics, is the opposite. So the majority of the patients that survive and are follow long term in our clinics are actually type 2 and type 3. And this is kind of uh, practically important when we start to implementing new uh, treatment in real life clinic setting. SMN1 uh, and the pathogenesis, John. Tell us a little bit about the protein and what tissues are affected and we, in which ways. Mm -hmm. Well, it's common to all patients with SMA that they're deficient in SMN protein. But what does mm -hmm. the survival motor neuron protein actually do in the body? That's less well understood mm -hmm. despite extensive work for many decades. Um, the uh, role in perhaps RNA uh, trafficking and other things has been described. Um, but what tends to happen is uh, SMN is expressed in all tissues of the body, but in anterior horn cells in the spinal cord in particular, a deficiency of SMN leads to this uh, uh, progression of damage and eventual loss of motor neurons in the spinal cord and brainstem over the lifespan of an individual with SMA. Uh, but SMN also has other roles in the lower motor neuron. It's involved in nerve signaling uh, and transport of proteins along the nerve. Uh, the neuromuscular junction is dysfunctional in people who are SMN deficient, and this may be related related to the symptom of fatigue that people often describe when they have SMA, particularly those who have <coughs> higher levels of function will describe fatigue okay. as a prominent symptom. They might symptom. be able to walk and be ambulatory, but the endurance is not quite normal, for right. example, in the type 3. Mm -hmm. And then the muscle itself, um, if it's developing denervated, it does not develop normally. Um, if it did develop fully innervated, once you lose that innervation, it also will progress and become atrophied and dysfunctional over time. Um, and so there's multiple potential targets within the lower motor neuron mm -hmm. um, for correcting SMN deficiency. In the very severe form, sometimes we even see progression of autonomic involvement. And so this can be seen either in the congenital onset form of SMA or also also in those who have more severe infantile onset as they get older that they'll start having heart rate fluctuation, blood pressure issues, <coughs> other things. So what's common to all patients with SMA is that they will have involvement of their limbs in terms of their weakness. You'll see joint contracture and weakness. Um, GI dysfunction is quite homogeneous as well um, and there can be issues with nutrition but also mo and motility and reflux. Um, as you get into the more severe forms, you start to see scoliosis of the spine as an orthopedic issue, and also the ball bar involvement becomes more prominent, and you have issues with speech and swallowing, and also <coughs> the respiratory morbidity that can be life-threatening mm -hmm. for patients. And the severe type 1, you know, uh, speaking and voice is uh, not obtained, mm -hmm. uh, and in the type 2 can be very, very feeble. In terms of the heart, though, we don't have uh, very... Uh, prominent cardiomyopathy or arrhythmia. It's more of the autonomic. Um, it can be autonomic involvement, except in the very severe the cases. Case. Sometimes you can see congenital onset patients with SMA having congenital heart defects as well. And then on a research basis, we've also looked at other tissues and their involvement in SMA. So we can see um, some uh, research-based studies that have shown uh, liver involvement with low insulin-like growth factor and iron overload. Um, the spleen and the thymus can be displaced functional in SMA, and this may be related to how people with SMA with similar levels of morbidity um, can be more prone to infection than other neuromuscular disorders with similar bulbar involvement. Um, and uh, this also may be partially related to the fact that, um, you know, now that we're supporting people with SMA more effectively with our uh, multidisciplinary care, um, some of these other tissues are manifesting more than what was seen in the past. Um, and certainly with the onset of disease 
disease-modifying therapy, I think the survival is longer. I think we'll all learn together well, about learn new manifestation and new phenotypes. What the long-term yeah. complications long -term, might be. Yeah. Absolutely. So it is crucial that we promptly and correctly diagnose SMA. And yet we know that the diagnosis of SMA remains challenging at the clinical levels. Let's take a moment to listen to some patient caregiver experiences related to the diagnosis during their SMA journey. It took us about two and a half months to get a correct diagnosis. We were first diagnosed with low muscle tone. We knew there was issues right away. Our doctors were not well versed on it at all. We ended up hitting the emergency room at two and a half months with two collapsed lungs. We actually asked them to test them for SMA. So he was about two months, three weeks old when we got our diagnosis officially. A lot of damage had already been done. From the time the blood work was done until we got the diagnosis was about three weeks. I do not feel that the doctor who diagnosed us was well informed. I was diagnosed at 18 months. I started showing symptoms around 12 months old. So it took about six months to get a diagnosis, an accurate diagnosis of SMA, type 3. So John and Nancy, what strikes you in these comments? Obviously, um, SMA is a journey and it's a disease that really affects the whole family, mm -hmm. um, uh, not just the patient, the caregivers. <clears throat> and um, tell us about this uh, diagnostic delay, diagnostic odyssey, how it's referred mm -hmm. to sometimes. Well, I think uh, part of the issue is that SMA is, is rare and infrequent. So most clinicians, especially at the front line in primary care will not have encountered many, many cases. And there are many other potential causes for hypotonia and um, early motor delays. And I think that the fact that most of the motor milestones in the first year or two of life have a really wide variability. There is variability, yeah. yeah. So that, um, <clears throat> in a sense, when we're seeing a child who might be um, just at borderline or mildly delayed in terms of their motor milestones and a bit hypotonic, there's a part of all of us that wants to be very compassionate and um, root for the child, hope that they're just um, taking their time to develop uh, normally. But I think that the um, scenario is really changing now that we have potentially treatable causes, um, and SMA is one of those very prominent ones, so that um, knowing that there is treatment available and that the earlier the diagnosis is made and the treatment is initiated, the better the it's outcome, it yeah. really becomes mandatory that we think of SMA and any other potentially treatable cause and screen for them immediately rather than giving the child that luxury of, um, of, of some wait lag and time. See. So there is a, right. uh, an important balance between wait and see and, and not um, um, looking subject for the treatable the patients causes. for unnecessary burden of right. invasive testing and so <clears> forth. <throat> On the other hand, you don't want to uh, delay an important diagnosis that could lead to prompt and early mm -hmm. uh, treatment. So let's put this in perspective with the real uh, patient case, Brandon. Um, he was first noted to have poor tone and had control at two months. Uh, difficulty gaining weight, and he was hospitalized at three months for pneumonia, and workup of his failure to thrive and hypotonia was performed during that hospitalization. And genetic testing confirmed a homozygous SMN1 deletion with um, an SMN2 copy number of two, and his initial CHOP in 10 score was 20. Now, the CHOP in 10 is um, the primary motor scale that is used in very young um, children to kind of monitor um, their motor function. And this really is quite a, a classic um, story and presentation for the classic type one. Let's um, move on and see um, what uh, the data uh, show in terms of the diagnostic delay, like in this case scenario. Um, it was pretty prompt, but we know that from data that even in type 1, which is the most severe form, which, you know, symptoms are quite uh, severe and early on, there is still an average delay of about four months. And remember, you know, motor, time is motor neuron now, and we have intervention. So four months is quite a long time. And then if you look at type 2 and type 3, the red bar is the when the symptoms start compared to the blue bar when actually the diagnosis is confirmed, there is a large gap. 
to confirm the diagnosis, certainly for type 3 <coughs> and then for the rare type 4, that's even more. Um, so what are the, some of the implication of a diagnostic uh, delay? John. I think the challenge is that once you lose a motor neuron, it's not going to come back, you know, so we want to try with any intervention that we're making that's disease targeted to get it in as early as possible because these are irreversible losses that we're dealing with in the nervous system. And as much as you want what's remaining to stay healthy and re as much as possible, if you lose that initial substrate, you're born with the motor neurons that you have for life. You can't make more of you them. You cannot yeah. make new motor mm -hmm. neuron. And um, so, Nancy, can you take us through the clinical presentation and the differential diagnosis? Certainly, we have genetic testing. When should we think about moving towards genetic testing? What other differential um, should we have in our list? And um, tell us a little bit, of course, the importance mm -hmm. of history taking and the neurological exam. What should we think in differential diagnosis? Sure. I, I first want to make the point that it, um, the clinical ability to diagnose by and suspect spinal muscular atrophy is not something that's going to be um, irrelevant over time because as uh, John has pointed out, 95 percent of the um, uh, children will show up with a simple um, genetic test looking for homozygous deletion of SMN1. Newborn screening, by the way, is also based on that same principle so that, you know, 95 percent of all cases will be picked up with the newborn screening. But this does leave that very, very important up to 5 percent who might have um, absolutely clear-cut um, responsive to these disease-modifying agents, SMA, who will only be picked up if additional testing is done based on the suspicion of the clinicians. So the clinical diagnosis is not going to go away. We're still going to be Absolutely. very attentive because there are also known 5Q SMA, other form of SMA that have different genes, right. positive genes. So. Right. And, but again, I, we, this is a rare disorder. So amongst, if we talk first about the infantile presentation, the most severe form, yeah. where children have low muscle tone and a weakness and some delay in their motor milestones or some loss of motor skills, um, there are other things that can present very similarly. Um, most of the things that would present in infancy other than SMA would be things that would have more of a footprint or presence in the newborn period. Things like congenital muscular dystrophy, certain congenital myopathies, congenital myasthenic syndromes, right. congenital myotonic dystrophy, and, and these. Um, but, um, uh, and then there are a few other even more rare forms of SMA. Uh, if you try to differentiate those, one of the differentiating features historically will be the relatively um, um, more normal newborn period with classical SMA. However, if you have a, a family with a first child who has um, born into that family, they may not um, be able to as clearly differentiate what is a normal newborn really period. Really pick up on the subtle right. early signs of hypotonia. Exactly. That so, so that may be a little bit harder to ferret out. Um, but some of the other things that you can look for are the um, profound decrease in muscle stretch reflexes. They're very difficult to get in a child with classical SMA. Another feature would be uh, the pattern of um, respiratory weakness. The um, intercostal muscles are very weak as compared to the diaphragm, which is depended on with babies um, who have SMA. So therefore, they, ha they tend to have more of a bell-shaped chest, um, and then because the diaphragm is uh, descending during contraction, it pushes the belly out and up. So they have this paradoxical movement with their abdominal muscles moving up during inspiration, which is atypical for babies. So this will be the belly breathing the that belly we breathing. have been mm -hmm. trained to recognize. Mm -hmm. and, and then the final thing would be the tongue fasciculations, which because very of important. the denervation of the tongue muscle are very uh, prominent. Yeah. in babies with um, SMA. But that can be kind of difficult. You have to look for um, irregular, um, uh, involuntary, writhing kind of movements within the tongue in, substance itself. In a very itself. young baby, that can be a little bit tricky, but and that's that certainly tricky. something to look uh, mm -hmm. for. And those would be things that would make you think more of SMA. But again, if there's any question, the point is to go ahead and do the diagnostic testing right. uh, targeted to SMA, not 
a broad panel with MRI right. of the brain and spine and a lot of other things that Although will give you your diagnosis. Although maybe for, for example, for the congenital muscular dystrophy, for example, mm -hmm. a simple test like CK that could kind of help you kind of tease out some mm -hmm. of those differential. And then in the in the older um, mm -hmm. presentation, the older children mm -hmm. or even mm -hmm. adolescents and, and young adults, what's the In the older the children, um, they usually present with um, a um, decline in their motor function. Uh, uh, inability to run or climb or failing to gain that after they walk, um, beginning to fall with buckling at the knees. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing that happens is um, a tremor, um, which is a very, very fine tremor. It used to be called mini polymyoclonus, but mm -hmm. basically it's just a fine to and fro um, even uh, tremor that occurs when they're using uh, right. their extremities, when they're reaching out and all. That and then the very profound decrease in reflexes are a few of the things that will help differentiate that from other things that look very similar on the surface, like limb girdle muscular dystrophies, for example. So that will be the big differential, like limb girdle muscular dystrophy and other dystrophy, maybe some congenital myopathies. Right. Um, and again, the reflexes are very, very important. So, uh, John, take us through the steps of, so if you clinically now suspect maybe a SMA in your differential based on your history and the clinical examination, nowadays, what will be the diagnostic algorithm to confirm the diagnosis as soon as possible? I think in the era of having disease-modifying treatments, um, we have much greater accessibility to this simple genetic testing. So there's often free or sponsored testing programs, depending on where you are located, that might be available to look for this homozygous deletion of SMN1. If that's present, that's very sensitive and specific for SMA, you have your diagnosis. So DNA testing can be done through blood or saliva, universally Correct. pretty much available now, should be your first step like unlike right. the olden days where we will go maybe to muscle biopsy or more invasive yeah, testing. And you need a rapid turnaround for that and test because quick. you want to know, especially in the infantile onset, quickly so that you can right. institute treatment as soon as possible. Usually um, genetic tests come back in seven to maybe a couple of weeks. But average. we have some that are now or even, even two-day turner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if you've done your double deletion test and it's not confirmatory, mm -hmm. then you're obliged to sequence the SMN1 gene because you're looking for a sequence change or an inversion or something as the reason why a copy of SMN1 is non-functional. Um, the 5% yeah. that you mentioned yes. earlier. Yes. So if that also is negative, then you start doing some other neuromuscular-related workup, thinking about either non-5Q SMAs or whether you have another localization for what might be causing your symptoms. And those mm -hmm. tests will include maybe an EMG, the CPK, maybe a muscle biopsy, and those known 5Q SMA types are extremely rare and very heterogeneous, unfortunately, so that's going to be a bigger um, workup. Um, what about prenatal testing? Are we there and how is yeah. that helping? I think um, you brought up the concept of time as motor neuron already. We want to get treatment started as soon as possible and there have been recommendations here in the United States uh, from the Obstetrics and Gynecology College to screen all pregnant families for carrier status for SMA. Um, if both parents are identified as carriers, they would have a one in four chance of having an affected fetus um, and cho uh, choosing to test your fetus based on what technology might be most appropriate based on the time of gestation um, can lead to a diagnosis of SMA in a child before they're born. Um, if that happens, we'd strongly encourage referral to a specialized care center for SMA to discuss that result because there's tremendous implications both in terms of what might be planned for the baby when they're born and what kind of interventions might be available, but also genetic counseling of the family and risk to other people who may be thinking about family planning as well. So these discussions are complex and they're becoming even more complex now with uh, disease modifying treatment um, and so they really belong in a setting with a good genetic counselor and a neuromuscular specialist but in terms of newborn screening uh, it was recently approved and tell us a little bit about the current state across uh, the United States. Yes, um, we've had it on the recommended universal screening panel from the federal government since 2018, um, but each state has their own approach to whether they're going to implement it in the first place, and if so, what technology that they use. So we've seen rapid implementation across several states. Um, some were even doing it before the timing of the RUSP, and, and more have come on board now with um, others having adopted but not yet implemented. But you can see from this map that the majority is in darker shades of purple, and so we're hoping for an 
an age where all um, babies will be screened at birth um, when born uh, for this disease. Now it's important to understand where these technologies fail. So on the prenatal side, um, if a parent has two copies of SMN1 on one allele and zero on the other, this test for homozygous deletion is going to say they're not a carrier because it sees both of those copies, but they can still pass that zero copy allele along with a one in four chance. And so this can be false negative even in the context of having done prenatal carrier yeah, screening. Yeah, so that's a pitfall that needs to be um, remembered. Yes, mm -hmm. and then in the context of newborn screening, we bring up this concept again of the 5% percent. that'll be missed exactly. because they don't have a homozygous I guess deletion is the reason why they're destined so to have So we still SMA. need very savvy and uh, uh, trained clinicians, neuromuscular clinicians for this. And um, uh, But hopefully we're moving towards having um, universal screening uh, probably in the next two to three years. But right now we're in a mixed landscape mm -hmm. um, still. So the treatment landscape has changed uh, dramatically in the past um, few years in a very exciting way for us as neurology and neuromuscular. In back uh, prior to December 2016, the care of SMA was really, you know, diagnosis and supportive care that was mostly centered on uh, pulmonary support and uh, physical therapy, orthopedic management of contractor and scoliosis. And then in December 2016, we had the first accelerated, um, very fast approval uh, of the first antisense oligonucleotide, nusinersen was approved uh, based on um, remarkable uh, trial data that we're going to go over in a moment. Um, newborn screening was approved to be added to the RASP in 2018. And then in May of 2019, Avexis 101 um, uh, SMN1 gene uh, transfer was approved, and um, two FDA uh, drugs now approved, and more in phase three clinical trials being studied as right now, and these are other uh, splice modifiers, some orals that we're mm -hmm. gonna um, discuss uh, briefly. Um, so now let's hear what patients and caregivers have to say regarding their experiences with these new SMA treatments. Our diagnosing doctor, she was very unaware that there were treatments very close to approval. I actually brought it up to his neurologist. His neurologist knew nothing about treatment. And it took 11 months after it was approved by the FDA to get him injections. So Nancy and John, what can we learn from these comments and how can we improve practice and, and expert access to this, uh, to this treatment? Uh, well, I think not just with SMA, but with all rare disorders, it's very difficult for everyone to be an expert in everything, including all of the rare disorders. Mm -hmm. And um, the field and the landscape is changing so rapidly that it's difficult even in major centers to always be um, uh, you know, at the front of the envelope. So I think that one of the things we need to do is just be aware that this is a very rapidly changing field and make certain to reach out to centers of um, um, excellence or centers that emphasize treatment mm. of some of these disorders and that are participating in the cutting edge clinical trials. So train more and more the next generation of neuromuscular expert is it becomes very very important yeah. and certainly educating general neurologists which mm -hmm. might not be taking the lead on maybe uh, treating this patient but they will take the lead and refer them very rapidly to, right. a, to a center with okay. expertise in SMA. So um, John let's look at the mechanism of, uh, of action of the first drug that was was approved, Nusinersen, who's an antisense oligonucleotide. How is the mechanism of action for this uh, drug? Uh, Nusinersen is a genetically targeted therapy, and so uh, patients with SMA um, have to have some copies of SMN2. If you have no SMN protein, it's incompatible with life. Um, what Nusinersen does is it targets the pre-messenger RNA, so there's been a message transcribed, um, but it it promotes inclusion of that exon 7 that's been missing in the natural state of SMN2 expression. Um, and so more often, um, exon 7 is included in that final transcribed and translated protein, and you end up getting more functional SMN2 protein um, made by the SMN2 gene that the patient already has. So it really acts on the messenger RNA, upregulating the production of a full length functional SMN protein. Mm -hmm. And by the way, this is a drug that is delivered 
intrathecally? Correct. Yeah, um, the challenge is if you were to take it orally, it wouldn't get where it really needs to go, which is the motor neurons in the spinal cord. And so that direct intrathecal delivery gives the highest concentration of the medication where it needs to be to protect And it has to be neurons. given at certain interval three times a year for kind of chronically. Yeah, that's the maintenance phase. There's a two-month loading phase to start. Also, yes. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the clinical studies for Nusenersen, there has been a very large um, program, different clinical trials. Can you tell us a little bit about the pivotal trials and all the data accumulated so far? Yeah, it's a remarkable international collaboration to make this happen amongst uh, many different centers. Um, the initial data from phase two trials is still being collected in extension studies to understand this uh, treatment in patients with various forms of SMA. Uh, but the two pivotal uh, placebo-controlled phase three studies were the INDEER study, which was carried out in infantile onset SMA, those with onset of symptoms before six months of age, and also the CHERISH study, which looked at primarily sitters, although some patients who had walked and lost that ability were able to be included in the criteria And for by the that. way, these were phase three randomized, they had a sham procedure uh, um, control arm, which is quite remarkable, but there was a pre-established interim analysis. Both of these phase three trials were interrupted early based on that uh, pre-specified interim analysis because of the p-values were so positive towards the treater, so quite Correct. remarkable. And then the one other trial to mention is the Nurture study, which was open label, but looked at patients who were pre-symptomatic or hadn't shown any symptoms or signs of SMA yet and were treated with either um, two copies or three copies of the SMN2 So gene. these were babies pre-symptomatic and men to develop eventually either type 1 or type 2 mm -hmm. uh, SMA. Right, so if you look at the efficacy results from these trials cumulatively in one graph, what you see is that the um, INDEER data, which you can see in the red squares there and the black triangles in the extension study, is a continued improvement over time in motor outcomes, which is the y-axis of the graph is motor milestone achievement. Um, as a neuromuscular specialist, looking at this data always amazes me because if we were to simply keep people the same in a disease that was, lose, that was right. destined to lose function, or even lose function at a slower pace than what the natural history would be. That is a therapeutic it achievement, but what we're looking at here is continued improvement, improvement um, and stabilization of a disease yeah. to allow natural development to happen super. And reaching close. milestone that will be unexpected uh, right. for the natural history. Yes. Um, if you look at the uh, yellow squares on this graph, that is also encouraging because these are patients who were initially on sham control. So they had, like the gray triangles, a natural history of loss for the first part of the trial, but then started on treatment and began to gain. And so this implies that there still is a salvageable aspect of motor neuron function that can be targeted even in those who at have the later symptomatically stage, progressed even at the later SMA. Stage. Um, Move startly. Yes, um, but then the lines that all of us are really heartened by are the top two, which are the patients in the nurture study who were treated before they had symptoms of SMA. And you can see that those lines are very close to normal development yeah. in terms of achievement of motor milestones. Um, so if we look at what this means practically in terms of milestone achievement with the nurture data, um, you can see that many of these patients are sitting, they're gaining head control, they're beginning to pull the stand, and at the last data, Cut many of them were walking, walking. independently. I think the hundred well. percent all yes. of them were actually sitting independently, mm -hmm. even the one with two copies, right? Yes. And uh, and all of the one with three copies were walking, mm -hmm. and I think probably the majority of the one with two copies were um, achieving the milestone. And the other thing I think that some were achieving the this milestone at the age, kind of a right. normal age. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the themes that are emphasized are earlier treatment is better, but that there is a role for treatment and across the spectrum of SMA right. severity. And here we just showed just what we just discussed about the reaching the milestone, like sitting, walking, crawling, and standing, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So thank you, John. And now moving on to the onazemnogen abeparvovac, or um, Avexis, uh, AVX 101. Uh, Nancy, how does this agent work and what does the data show in different SMA population? Mm -hmm. This has a completely different mechanism of action. Um, this is a treatment that aims to replace the SMN1 gene. So the, the SMN1 gene has been synthesized 
and this synthetic gene is then packaged within the viral capsid of an adeno-associated virus, the type 9. They selected one that was not likely to create a big immune reaction that not very many people had been exposed to, that wasn't going to incorporate into the human genome, um, and uh, it requires um, production of many, many copies. There are, I believe, the target doses uh, for the intravenous therapy um, of a single dose, um, an infusion of 3 times 10 to the 13th power. Um, and uh, this is delivered copies. through an through an IV, right? Right. In, in the the the, the trial that has been finished and the um, FDA approval for use in children under the age of two um, was for an it's intravenous been. infusion over, you know, part of uh, uh, one to two hours, um, and uh, the um, early trials you can see here demonstrated that um, with a, a good safety. Um, um, experience, um, but the initial experience did demonstrate um, a reaction with elevation of liver functions that was felt to be an immediate immune reaction. So uh, people, the additional trials after the very first patient were treated with um, oral prednisolone, one milligram per kilogram per day, one day before the IV infusion, infusion. and then continuing for a month with gradual tapers over the next several months. Um, you can see here that the first trials were in infants who were symptomatic and six or seven months of age um, with um, the first introductory dose meant really for safety um, evaluation. Um, and there was some stabilization and improvement in their motor milestones, but it wasn't very dramatic. Once that degree of safety was um, identified, an additional trial was um, initiated or the extension of that trial yes, yes. involved um, both increasing to the target dose in humans based on their uh, estimation of the uh, therapeutic target um, based on animal trials, as well as targeting younger children. So, so most that's of the 12 patients on the right on inside, the right, those are therapeutic dose, 12 patients. Right, with, with most of them treated um, under um, four or five months of age. Right. Um, and you can see that there was a very dramatic improvement in their yeah. motor scale scores. In fact, you can see the chop and tend um, bar there at 40, and that's sort of a, uh, the natural history experience suggesting that children with SMA who are untreated never reach they that. They never reach. Yeah. With, during their, any point in their development. Usually and, they linger around the 20s, low 20s. If mm -hmm. they do gain a couple of points, they'll eventually very fast lose right. them past six months. Because most of them are progressive from progressive the point in time rapidly, they, when they yeah. first are diagnosed. Yeah. And that's very different than the history here where you can see the treated children very rapidly improved. Now, um, because this is a, a weight-based treatment, the number of um, genes that had to be synthesized and, and packaged Delivered. in this way um, uh, is um, very impressive once you get to larger and older children. So um, the second trial, which is still ongoing, ongoing. involves um, using smaller doses but directly intrathecally administered as a single lumbar puncture, single Infusion, intrathecal dose. Yeah. Um, and this has been done in a number of children already uh, up to five years of age. Um, and you can see here, just looking at the numbers of children who've been treated between 6 and 24 months of age. Uh, the dark bars are those who've achieved those milestones uh, prior to uh, treatment. And then the period of observation at this data capture was um, usually um, somewhat less than one year. Mm -hmm. But even within that one year extension, you can see the gray bar extensions are those who were treated with the single intrathecal dose and then continued or gained milestones, again. which again is not common in the natural history of spinal muscular atrophy. But you could compare that with this next graph, which looks at that small group of children who are treated a little bit later, between two and five years of age, mm -hmm. and you can see that the fraction of them um, who over the next um, three quarters of a year of observation gained new milestones was somewhat less, showing the same kind of information with this 
uh, gene replacement therapy that we saw with the ASO, which is that the earlier the treatment, it seems like the better the outcomes. Yeah, for example, with standing, you know, yeah. that's a uh, acquired skill that will be unexpected. Right. And so, um, Nancy, tell us a little bit about monitoring patients for side effects. Mm -hmm. um, um, okay. What the monitoring for nusinersen is really um, based on both the, the general experience with antisense oligonucleotide therapy in all people as well as these trials that John described. Um, there were uh, some individuals who historically in ASO trials or treatment had developed clotting problems um, and urine proteinuria um, because of the impact on the kidney. This has been very um, infrequent in the experience of the um, uh, trials with nusinersen, but nevertheless, uh, the um, packaging recommends that uh, before each dose, to that, monitor. The, that the children have clotting studies and um, urine protein checked. Um, there have been a number of children who, um, during the period of observation, and now there have been several hundred children treated and monitored over time who have developed um, hydrocephalus, and people are continuing to observe that to determine the relatedness and um, and what to make of that over time. It's so a very it's small number of cases. It's a very, I very small, small number. Yeah. I think it was three, but um, so yeah, um, blood work monitoring prior to each mm -hmm. dose, overall the safety mild to moderate though overall, um, and uh, for uh, um, the gene uh, transfer for the Avexis 101, mm -hmm. how do we monitor? Uh, again, the, it appears that the biggest uh, response is an immune one to this large number of uh, but foreign protein and viral capsids and the, and the synthetic gene. Um, there appears to be um, a variable degree of liver function elevation or hypertransaminitis that develops despite the pre-treatment with, with the, the prednisone. oral prednisone. Um, but this has been pretty manageable um, right. over time. Usually what it requires is either increasing or extending the duration the of the oral steroid therapy. Um, and it's asymptomatic, so in these cases you can see elevation of the liver enzyme, but the, the patient for the most part, it's been very clinically asymptomatic. asymptomatic versus there is a potential risk for true uh, liver failure, but very rare. But that mm -hmm. is in the label, in fact. Right, um, and uh, there is a not infrequent um, decrease in um, uh, platelet count um, mm -hmm. that's uh, felt to be complement mediated. You know, at seven to ten days, and um, then there are just the. Um, this is something that's much newer and we're continuing, uh, as I mentioned, the trial in the older children is continuing and um, there are some issues that p have been observed in animal trials right. having to do with change in markers of heart function and um, also uh, changes in pathology of sensory neurons that um, it's unknown whether this will have any significance for humans, yeah. and so this will be monitored. That safety data is still being monitoring. Right. The, the trials are ongoing, so it's, right. it's important to remember that this agent was only approved mm -hmm. uh, exactly. May of 2019. Right. So we have um, more data coming, and um, so these are now in the post-commercial phase, FDA approved, but. Um, John, uh, what do we have in phase three clinical trials coming down the pikes for, um, for more potential uh, drugs for SMA, uh, maybe concentrating on RISDiplom, which I think is... Uh, yeah, at the start of 2020, um, we're hopeful that the next entry into the clinical arena may be small molecule therapy. Um, so this technology, again, takes advantage of these SMN2 genes in terms of increasing um, the uh, expression of SMN protein through alternative splicing. Um, but the advantage of these agents is that they can be delivered orally or via G-tube, um, which is less complex to do than uh, intrathecal therapy, but also allows for systemic expression of SMN protein to other tissues, which may have an advantage to it as we have people living different lives with SMA on treatment. 
Um, these have been studied primarily in Europe, but also in the United States. Um, and there's ongoing studies that have had data presented at recent academic meetings. Um, similar to other programs, there's been different populations studied. So the um, firefish study was open label in infantile onset SMA, and the sunfish study looks at patients 2 to 25 years of age with milder forms, SMA type 2 or 3, based on natural history. Um, there's also a jewel fish study, which is inclusive of patients who have been treated with other SMA targeted therapies um, and then uh, switch to um, Ristaplam. That's interesting because that includes through adult patient up yes. to 60 years of age, which Correct. is, you know, so it's a broad spectrum of ages in mm -hmm. this program. And then similar to others, there's also a pre-symptomatic trial called Rainbow Fish where patients are treated before the onset of SMA symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, symptoms. And so if you look at the firefish study in terms of efficacy, you can see that there um, is a achievement of a score greater than 40 on the CHOP and 10 in the majority of patients. They're sitting, uh, they have head control, a small number are standing. Um, and in terms of tolerability, there's been no significant safety events reported. Um, initially with this development program, there was some concerns about retinal toxicity, but that hasn't perpetuated in later iterations of the studies. Um, and now it's, it's things like fever, upper respiratory infection, constipation, which were things that were seen in all of the studies related to SMA. So as no, not any emergent uh, serious side effects so far. Correct. So Nancy, can you give us an overview of the SMA care guidelines? And we want to stress, of course, that because we do have new disease-modifying uh, treatment, um, it is still extremely important to really care for for this patient mm -hmm. a multidisciplinary approach. We cannot forget about uh, right. these are obviously so far not <clears throat> cure. So what is required in terms of clinical care? Well, well before the um, introduction of the disease modifying therapies in 2016, it was shown that um, there were uh, different types of supportive cares, um, assuring good nutrition, assuring uh, clearance of airways and um, uh, adequate ventilation, um, particularly during sleep when everyone breathes a little bit more shallowly, um, minimizing um, uh, problems with bone and contractures and managing scoliosis, all of these things. Doing those actually improved outcomes and there was some data to that, um, to that end even before we came to the much more uh, potent th treatment, treatment of the yeah. disease modifying therapies. Um, but one of the most important things, I think, to emphasize right now in the era of disease-modifying therapies is that uh, there is still this pool, we believe, of vulnerable motor neurons that are still, you know, not thriving perfectly but at risk and vulnerable that um, uh, would um, not only have some response to the other therapies but also respond to the same supportive cares that we've noted right. all along so that the better nutrition, the better ventilation. Um, so it's very important to still deliver all mm -hmm. the other supportive care. Exactly. So that despite the um, wonderful disease modifying therapies, all patients with SMA should be monitored and continue to provide that Very proactively care. to with the goal to really improve quality of life. Exactly. So and that is um, very important. Mm -hmm. And in the care guidelines, I think that the the way they have described the guidelines is for non seeders, seeders and walkers, because mm -hmm. obviously these are kind of different groups rather than stick with mm -hmm. the number of copies of SM and two. It's really right. what functional level right. is that particular patient at what should be monitored proactively and what to do. And, um, and these guidelines have been not only published in uh, the Journal of Neuromuscular Disorders, but also available from Cure SMA for families as well as for primary care and primary clinicians care and, and, and neurologists and other neuromuscular people um, to provide them with, with guidance. And the, um, the classification which lists the you know, best motor skill, like non-sitters or sitters and walkers, um, pertains to not just the orthopedic um, care no. that needs to be provided, but obviously because non-sitters have weakness in their axial muscles, they're more subject to problems with swallowing and breathing. And so your goals of the, cares are really different uh, for the different The kind of supportive patients, care would right. be much more extensive. So care coordination is a critical aspect of mm -hmm. SMA care. Let's hear what the patients and caregivers have to say about their experiences. There's been minimal care team 
basically going on our own, and four or five different types of doctors around the doctors that have come through, and we wouldn't have to really move rooms, and I, I, I really enjoyed that part of the clinic. Yes, I do have follow-up in a multidisciplinary clinic. My doctors are in communication with each other for the most part, and then there's a social worker to coordinate care between them. So, John and Nancy, what uh, jumps out at you in these comments from the patients? What does it take to really have a good multidisciplinary clinic that works? Yeah, I think the challenge is it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. It depends a lot on the resources that you have available in your local care context. Maybe everybody can be in one shared clinic space. Maybe you're relying on some referral and coordination of care, um, but you're trying to really optimize the life of the person living with SMA, considering also all the psychosocial implications and everything else that they might face. So um, one is minimizing the trips to different subspecialty, like, yeah. you know, have them there. And also being conscious that interfacing with the medical system is a challenge for these patients because you're coming into an area where you're more at risk of being exposed to infections, which they're more prone to stress related to. Um, uh, but you're trying to uh, get all of the different aspects of what is a very complicated multi-system disorder, optimize as much as possible, and then also monitor the effects of these treatments on the patients as well, that we need to be continuously looking for the clinical outcomes in our patients so that we can continue to advocate for their use and also um, monitor for any potential long-term implications that we are not aware of yet because these are also new. And some of the scales like the CHOP, the HINE, the Hammersmith, these are very quite specialized requires physical therapists that are trained in monitoring you know the uh, the improvement in this patient so and the yes. the, um, the time in the natural history of each person that they'll need the, the specialists may be very very different right. I think the need for the genetics um, uh, and genetic counselors is is very very great at the beginning when the family needs a lot of guidance um, either with results of newborn screening or um, making decisions um, and then looking at the um, needs of the extended family in terms of counseling as well as we're hoping later on as the individuals with SMA may need additional genetic counseling with so respect really to their, their own families, yeah. Yeah, and uh, so this lead us, uh, John, what, is, uh, what do you think the future of, uh, of SMA moving forward? How is the, the landscape and treating and uh, are we gonna have an all different landscape moving yeah. forward? As much as the progress up until this point is remarkable, there's still a lot of unanswered questions and a lot to explore that we're all very excited about as a community to think about the way that the phenotype is evolving on treatment and what optimal management is from an orthopedic, a pulmonary, a nutrition standpoint as patients are shifting categories. You know that people who were destined to be non-sitters are now achieving yes. milestones but in a very different way um, than what would be um, seen in the natural history of SMA and what is the right way to support those patients and then to start thinking about as we get more and more therapeutic options into the arena are there ways that we could potentially combine approaches Com or, or time therapy. them at different aspects of development for different patients depending on the severity of their phenotype are there other biomarkers that will help us understand better how people are going to behave beyond the SMN2 co copy number um, to help us uh, optimally uh, support somebody and have them have the best possible life living with SMA. So certainly moving forward, uh, more treatment at the pre-symptomatic stage most likely, but discovery of perhaps new phenotypes. Yes. And I think there will have to be a lot more post-marketing uh, monitoring of, of, the, of the families or in the individuals um, if we're going to be getting into combinations and, and new and therapies and things effect. like that so that we really know what the outcome is. Okay, wonderful. So thank you, Nancy and John, for the great discussion. Um, let us now summarize the key takeaways or SMART goals. Simple genetic testing will pick up 95% of cases of uh, spinal muscular atrophy. There are now disease-modifying therapies available, and data suggests that early diagnosis and treatment lead to optimal outcomes and the importance of implementing strategies for multidisciplinary care coordination for patients with SMA guided by a neuromuscular specialist cannot be emphasized enough. Uh, thank you all for joining us. I encourage you to visit the CME Outfitters website for a comprehensive list of clinical resources, additional educational activities for both providers and patients. 
Welcome back. Uh, we have received uh, quite a number of questions. The first question says, should we refer patients for CSF testing to determine best treatment option? Um, I think the challenge John. there is that's not an easily accessible tissue, right? So you want to try to look for things that are easily testable in patients. Um, and we don't have great data about any biomarker being correlated to the severity of SMA um, in terms of SMN protein expression, for example. But I think, uh, Nancy, you've been involved in quite a bit of work related to neurofilament, right? Is that something that people have been looking at recently? I, well, I think, as we mentioned earlier, people are looking for other biomarkers. And um, as um, uh, with the news and nursing studies, there was CSF that was obtained for research Collective. at the same time that the treatments were um, administered intrathecally. And people have noted th that the neurofilament light levels um, appear to have responded. Um, uh, and uh, the question is, um, do we have enough information about what the natural change? It does appear that in newborns it's much higher than it is later in life naturally, and the exact rate at which it declines in people who don't have SMA hasn't yet been charted out. Um, so I think that this is a very, very promising area of, um, of um, a potential guidance and For another the, biomarker, but we don't, we're not there yet. Bio bio. And speaking of uh, biomarkers, um, one of the viewers mm. is asking, is there data on creatine levels and correlation to disease severity? Can it be used as a biomarker, the CK? Or, or uh, it has creatine levels, so yeah. creatine levels. I, I think the challenge you can comment of, on both. Uh, so. mm. um, determining uh, creatine or other markers is that um, people with these neuromuscular disorders have lower muscle bulk in general, and so a lot of these markers are harder to interpret in those populations, and you have to um, uh, have some sort of normative data in the natural history, which is rapidly disappearing because we have all these patients mm. on therapy now. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so in terms of the maybe the so for the kidney toxicity, certainly creatine is not a good one in our neuromuscular population in general, but certainly for SMA, that's why we go to protein in the urines mm -hmm. to monitor the kidney toxicity for the antisense oligonucleotide. And then for the CPK, I don't think that that's a very um, useful biomarker if that was at this time, um, no. in the, not at this time. And then the next question, um, as primary care, I manage overall health of patients who has muscle disorders and see increased incidence of infection, pulmonary disease, and hypoglycemia. Any issues or concern I should be aware of? Assuming SMA patients. Well, I think that there are, <clears throat> there are um, we, we mentioned the fact that um, SMN proteins needed beyond the motor neuron. And there are a number of individuals with more severe disease, type 1s, and this very, very rare newborn onset type 0, who appear to have some degree of beta oxidation uh, defect. So, so they are subject to hypoglycemia with prolonged fasting. If that's seen, I think what you need to do is try to make sure that you avoid fasting so that if there are any um, uh, treatments or any other issues, um, or even overnight, um, a child not tolerating that length of uh, a relative fast to try to provide supplements and, and uh, things that would um, treat that as a specific um, right. uh, issue. Yeah, and also going back to the standard of care, um, immunizations, RSV, pro RSV, prophylaxis, all of these things mm -hmm. are still important to maintain even in the era of people being on treatment. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, of course, for some of these, uh, especially the young ones that end up maybe in the PQ in the winter season with uh, you know, pneumonia or respiratory problems, there are actually extubation protocols that can be very helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I think that um, the children with SMA who are under a year old um, many times are given Synergis as a preventive um, agent, just like the very ill and tiny premature babies under a right. year of age are given. That's another. So we have a question. This is an important question. Are both treatments approved in infants to adults? How do the agent differ in dosing and side effects and onset of action? So we need to clarify. So nusinersen is approved for all ages, uh, all type of SMA, at least per label. So um, and uh, for the Avexis 101, it's only so far approved for patients 0 to 24 months right. of age, so not for adults. And in terms of onset of action, 
Um, John, you want to comment about onset of action for the two different drugs? I think it's challenging when you try to look across the different studies because all were slightly different in terms of their baseline populations and their timing of monitoring and what outcome measures they were using. Um, uh, but the general theme is that there's not a time-locked response for any of these therapies, that it really depends on how symptomatic the patient was when you got them on therapy and what age they were when they were that symptomatic. So in other sense, how severe their disease is when you detected it and when you got them onto mm -hmm. treatment, um, that has uh, implications. So it's again emphasizing this theme of as soon as possible getting treatment started, which means diagnosing as soon mm -hmm. as possible when somebody has SMA. And I think that for news in nursing, looking at those graphs over and over of the published trials, there is a sense that, you know, it can start in quite early, you know, the more severe, the, maybe the, the sooner, obviously, mm -hmm. but then there is a trend that they don't really plateau, they keep on going up slowly over time, there isn't like a, a plateau yeah. generally, that's the sense. Of course, in the type 3, in the ambulatory, less severe patients, you know, it takes longer because maybe all you're seeing is stabilization of their motor function mm -hmm. rather than, you know, significant mm -hmm. improvement. So. Um, and then for the Avexis, I think that there are some reports that, you know, obviously the replication starts quite early mm -hmm. um, and uh, some effects have been seen even at one month. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about the management of spine deformities in this patient? Best option based on data, Nancy? I think there are so many areas of uh, natural history of spinal muscular atrophy, particularly treated, where we just don't have any natural history data or any observations to really uh, do this. I think that we, um, people historically have been using the principles that orthopedists and rehabilitation physicians and neuromuscular specialists have learned from treating scoliosis in weak patients mm -hmm. as compared to treating scoliosis in just idiopathic um, variety in healthy, uh, strong individuals. Um, and uh, so um, uh, one of the issues comes is that, uh, that, that comes up is that frequently the severity of the scoliosis is such that people want to address it before children reach their uh, growth potential, mm -hmm. before they stop growing. And um, so, uh, the new introduction of things like growing rods, the growing, um, where the magic rods, the, yeah, first, uh, vector and, magic. and growing rods and magic rods, where um, either repeat surgeries or now with magnetic guidance, some of the um, uh, mechanical devices used to correct the scoliosis can actually be lengthened to match the child's growth. And then it remains to be seen if with this uh, disease-modifying agent moving forward, we're going to see less of scoliosis development. Exactly. That, or different kinds. Or you different know, because kinds Because sometimes of scoliosis. Um, patients who are a little bit weaker uh, but then gain the ability to sit through changing category from non-sitter to sitter yes. are different than those who were sitting and then had progression of their disease and became weaker. Mm -hmm. um, so I think they're going to be different in how we manage them. John, I think that one of the viewers has a question again. Again, can you explain the negative screening again? I think the the negative uh, newborn screening. genetic right. newborn screening um, so, again. Um, prenatally, if the parent has zero on one allele and two on the other allele of SMN1, they can still pass that zero along, but they will be detected as non-carrier because the test sees both of those SMN1 genes. So that's a false negative result, and it varies by ethnicity. It's more common in African Americans, for example, to have this change, um, but that's an important thing to know when you're um, counseling a family about a test result related to prenatal screening. The newborn screen um, is highly specific if it's detected but still misses those who have a sequence change or something other than a deletion as the reason why the SMN. So it picks 95% because yeah. those are deletion, but for that 5% that might be a different type of mutation, you need sequencing and that will not come through the newborn screening, will have correct, to be yeah. um, through clinical confirmation yes, or and suspicion. Most, most states are choosing not to screen for carrier status, so they only screen for 
it true homozygous deletion, not for having only one copy missing. Right. Um, and so you don't know if you're at risk of having a child with SMA through your newborn right. screening test. One of the issues with respect to newborn screening, and I think that we should try to address a little, although I think the answer will only come over time with a lot of experience collectively, is what people do with that screen. Because we'll get the fact that it's a positive um, uh, absence of SMN1 and will be provided with a, a copy count of SMN2. And again, we're hoping for more biomarkers over time to give us additional guidance. But right now in real time, people will be meeting with families um, and genetic counselors and all where we'll have to deal with what are the treatment options. We've talked so much about there being earlier, um, a benefit to earlier treatment. Anticipating this, a number of individuals were brought together by the CureSMA and there are, is um, one article in the literature and now a letter to the editor to follow up on that, um, talking about what um, consensus experts might uh, offer teams around the country in dealing with this result of newborn screening. And in general, uh, at the from the very beginning, people were feeling that if there were two or three copies of um, SMN2, that they would recommend immediate pre-symptomatic treatment. The question came with, well, what about with four copies? And there was um, about a year ago when this first was being discussed, no consensus in the group. We couldn't reach absolute consensus. People have been thinking about it a little bit more and now are recommending in this letter to the editor that even with four copies um, of SMN2 uh, that those children be offered early treatment. And that's for several reasons. One of the hesitations before was that people weren't as good about uh, detecting and clarifying that it was four copies rather than five, six, or more. Now they've got better technology and can be clearer that it's only four copies. The other thing is that um, the longer you wait to, to introduce treatments, for example, like the um, AAV9 um, associated um, gene replacement, uh, the longer interval the person has to potentially be exposed to that virus so that they would have antibodies and be ineligible for the gene replacement. Um, and then finally, just the additional ongoing information talking about or demonstrating that early treatment is helpful in all circumstances. Right. So that's one of the things that people will be doing, but I, I cannot, I don't want to imply that there are clear answers to all of this. I think this is going to be a the very learning, complicated discussion. Yeah. And the and learning, we'll all be learning curve is, is very steep and, and yes. fast, we'll all be but learning the, for the field is changing rapidly, but right. we don't have all the answers. We have a practical question here from a, OB practitioner, is it safe for mothers uh, to breastfeed patients with muscle disorders? I assume with SMA, any risk? And maybe we can expand it to what if they are treated with uh, either Nusinersen or Avexis 101? Any concern for breastfeeding? I think there's multiple layers to how this is complicated. So the first is that generally breastfeeding is preferred for somebody who is safe to swallow, but if somebody's having issues with their coordination, sometimes it's not possible to breastfeed if you have bulb or weakness. Um, if you're considering gene uh, transfer therapy and the mother is antibody positive, then it's possible that she passed those antibodies along to her infant. And if that's the case, sometimes repeating those uh, antibody tests serially can allow them to fall to a level where treatment is safe. The recommended level is one in 50. That's uh, after stopping breastfeeding, yes. if the mom has the antibodies. Right. Um, but if the, the mother is not seropositive and the baby is not seropositive, then you can continue breastfeeding even in the context of gene transfer therapy based on the current label. Um, and then, of course, some severe babies, like with the type 1, they are not really able to breastfeed successfully due to the bulbar weakness. Yeah. That's also... Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, can you go through details of treatment dose and duration with each agent and any experience you have on increasing dose and how you assess efficacy and any data on combination therapy? So, <laughs> these are drugs where there is a very specific dose. So for Avexis 101, it's based on weight and it's a one-time dose. So that's what should be used for Nusinersen. It's a one-dose fits-all. It's uh, 
uh, 12 milligrams, 12 milligrams each dose, in five a and two now. month loading phase, and then a every four month maintenance every four phase. Months. Mm -hmm. yeah. But again, um, these things are still under investigation. Yeah, exactly. And I think that even for New Zealanders, there is uh, some uh, potential further studying about maybe uh, different doses, um, higher doses. But any data on combination therapy, actually, that in the clinical setting, people of practitioners are already talking about, and many of us have treated now young uh, infants with both of these available treatment indeed. So as we touch a little bit, John, we think that maybe that might be the future, that there might be um, a combination. Yeah, I think that the struggle is there's very little peer-reviewed data about this. Um, some of the patients that were in the original gene therapy trial did subsequently go on to nusinersen treatment, for example, um, and then there were patients already on commercial nusinersen who received gene transfer through an early access program before the therapy was approved. So we do have some data in both directions that was collected in a um, somewhat structured manner, um, but now that they're both in the clinic, there's They'll also people that are being treated and, and we're just going to have to learn as a community. And this brings us to another interesting question. So this is important. Are pre-symptomatic babies being treated outside of clinical trials currently? Yes, absolutely yes. So pre-symptomatic. So in states where the newborn screening is already ongoing, obviously those that's the way we practice, like they True. come to us, the majority, 95%, yes. come at the pre-symptomatic stage and we have two commercially approved medication to choose from, so yes, totally. In those states where there is no newborn screening, we're still relying on the clinical diagnosis so they could come to you either pre-symptomatic, based on family history perhaps, or at the symptomatic, but yes. Um, you have two medication to choose from. And then any tips any tips for getting access to treatment for patients and families? So access, this issue of, you know, approval versus access. Um, yeah, I think the key point is you have to meet a care team at, at a center that really focuses on SMA because they're going to give you a comprehensive approach to your individualized circumstance in terms of what options there are for treatment and then also be familiar with the different mechanisms for getting those treatments to happen for the person. Yeah, so the decision of what drugs, combination, yes or no, mm -hmm. what kind of outcome measure to follow the response because you're gonna have to decide is it worth it to continue, is it working, is it not working. So they're very, very complex uh, strategies. So I think the patients are best served to have at least um, a multidisciplinary center with expertise in SMA, and then they can be co-managed with their more local um, physician. I think that in terms of access also, it's because the people that do, let's say, SMA or neuromuscular disorder as 100% of their practice, they're gonna have that infrastructure and team to really work on getting uh, treatment quickly and efficiently. So if you have 50 patients with SMA versus this is the first patient ever came to your practice, obviously you're not set up to, um, to do that fast. Um, and this is a very uh, relevant question. Is there any benefit of using nursing treatment in an older individual, 69 years old, who has type 3 SMA? I guess I'm not the adult neurologist here, mm -hmm. I would say. So mm -hmm. it's interesting because um, um, the data for really adult patients uh, in Nusi Nursing are a little bit less than for the type 1 and type 2, but obviously the label cover all ages, all types. And I have to tell you uh, that about one third of patients uh, in real life um, treated in the in the world are actually adult patients with SMA and I think that are we're coming to have emerging literature now published about um, actually uh, benefits motor improvement in in older uh, patients these are obviously not um, randomized clinical trials for 69 years old but real life clinical practice and I certainly the oldest patient I have personally treated was um, 59 so I think that generally um, the approach is if you have an adult that you want to consider treatment as long as you decide what kind of outcome measure to follow so that you can decide um, if they're mm -hmm. actually uh, benefiting for the drug. And of course, because natural history is so much slower in older patients, 
you will have to decide if um, lack of decline is good enough or if you really want to see improvement in certain scale. One of the scale that we use most in in, um, in this age group, if they're ambulatory, of course, the six minutes walk or the 100 feet go. If they're non-ambulatory, then there is a, a scale that calls the upper limb module that really focus more on the upper uh, limb, and that can be very, very helpful. I've seen patient gaining two or three points on that scale, and that can really make a big difference in, in real life uh, functioning. We have a social worker, please, uh, she says, please remind your audience of how important it is to have us on the team. Absolutely, yes. social worker in the multidisciplinary clinic, so many aspects of social working, you know, um, community access, these are patients that might need access to go to college, to school, um, resources in the community, uh, dealing with insurance coverage for equipment, wheelchairs, uh, and also the um, behavioral health aspects, both of living with SMA yourself and sometimes how different stress points in life can affect you differently if you're living with chronic disease, but also the effect that this can have on caregivers and burnout and other things that we need to be vigilant for in our clinics that we're supporting all of the people that are involved in the care network that the, somebody yeah. has um, that, to make sure that we're addressing that, that aspect of health as well. Absolutely. So this is an important question. They say, outstanding program, thank you very much. Can you comment on how to find a pediatric muscle disorder specialist in your area? So I think that I, we will probably recommend uh, on the website of Cure SMA. Uh, I think it's curesma.com. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Cure SMA will pop Maybe up and uh, yeah. they list um, all the specialized center for SMA as mm -hmm. clinical center and also they list their uh, treating um, centers yeah. for the different therapies and they update their website quite um, timely. They also have that nice map of the newborn screening state if you're interested in knowing what's going on with that part. Mm -hmm. uh, I am a pharmacist. Please talk about the important role in gaining approval and getting access. Uh, Nancy, mm -hmm. tell us a little bit. And obviously pharmacist is another specialty pharmacy and pharmacies uh, mm -hmm. for, the, for the team, extremely important. Well, you know, there are some third-party insurances that are national, and there are others that are very state-specific, for example, some of the, um, the um, public um, insurances. Um, and each of those has to ha come up with a policy about how to d deal with this. Some of them also um, take uh, expensive infusion uh, type of treatment and make it be a, um, a separate um, benefit from the regular health care. Um, uh, and so some of them will um, uh, demand that you deal with um, uh, specialty pharmacies. Um, uh, and some hospitals um, will themselves um, assist families and the team in procuring the, the drug. So this will be something that will be, look very different in different parts of the country. Right. But pharmacists have been absolutely critical in, in all of this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you comment on the team you use for treatment of patients, team you use for dosing, nursing, nursing? So, um. Yeah, I think the challenge is that it's so patient specific because you have a heterogeneity of the type of patient that you're trying to target and what their needs might be around the procedure. Um, and so some patients can, um, you know, they're ambulatory and they have no scoliosis and it's very straightforward to do a lumbar the puncture in them and they're yeah. fine. Others have significant respiratory support needs and you're worried about positioning comfort related to their contractures. They have curvature of the spine which makes access more challenging so and we need to use imaging guidance or interventional radiology to get access. Um, and then also um, many of our patients need some sort of support for the procedure as well. And so figuring out what the right level of either anesthesia or sedation is for the individual patient. And we always want to use the least possible yeah, sedation but or to, certainly to anesthesia. Make it but it possible for them to do repeatedly without it being traumatic too. So, and maybe yeah. to conclude, this has been a good discussion. Um, can you uh, predict when the next uh, round of disease modifying treatment might be available, Nancy? Um, it's in the hands of the FDA. Right. Uh, RISDA plan 
uh, has already been submitted, and I think we have to wait and see. We're all hoping it'll be within the next. Well, maybe. here's something in the next six months, but yeah, the same maybe it's by in spring. the hands of FDA. Yeah. Yes. And this so. what's also amazing to me is you know it's always okay. There's this, but then what next? You know, we've made else. such amazing strides, but there's still so much we can do. So yeah. the the program is uh, yeah of the pipelines is very rich, and mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't mm -hmm. be surprised if we might have <laughs> even three treatment by next uh, spring, and so more questions, more more learning. Uh, for More potential sure. for combinations. Yes. Yeah. Um, I just hope as we move forward, it, it, with one last comment, that we can work out a way so that um, we have the opportunity to embrace all the patients with SMA, so yeah. that it's not just um, um, because of cost or other factors something that's being limited to uh, you know new the newborn the newborns and the, the potential for really incredible benefit with the newborns. But sometimes we've had the opportunity to treat patients of all ages mm -hmm. and sometimes a very small increase, something that you might not even it's measure on a scale, make a big difference. completely turns around the quality of life for that patient quality and makes them life, independent yeah. and really keeps them you know, um, gainfully employed, for example. Yeah. We do need better outcome measure moving mm -hmm. forward, no doubts, for different ages. So this has been a great discussion. Uh, thank you so much, uh, John and Nancy, for uh, joining me. And thank you very much to our audience for joining us and for providing very insightful uh, questions. Thank you very much.